if government has gotten out of control and is no longer in the business of securing rights, but in creating a centralized big system that somehow overruns our rights, the time has come for the states to step up and exercise their authority vested in them by the United States Constitution in Article 5. The Article 5 State Legislators Caucus and Path to Reform welcome you to this webinar, Restoring the American Voice, presented by the Honorable Ken Ivory, former Utah legislator and chair of the National Center to Restore the Balance of Government. Our host is the Honorable Neil Schurer, former Iowa State Senator and Executive Director for the Path to Reform. Welcome everyone to the first in a series of webinars hosted by State Legislators Article 5 Caucus and Path to Reform. Uh, just, uh, it's great to have people. We have people from all over the country uh, participating in this webinar. Uh, State Legislators Article 5 Caucus has uh, a goal of to reestablish federalism as the founders intended to limit the runaway growth of the federal government. That's the overall purpose of the State Legislators Article 5 Caucus. And our signature newsletter has been communicating with all 7,000 plus state legislators since 2013. And the response that we've had to this uh, webinar shows that uh, you are using the newsletter, you're using the information, uh, you're using it as an opportunity to share with your colleagues and your constituents. So uh, thank you for that. And I do wanna do a quick shout out here to Stu McPhail, who has been the editor for the Article 5 uh, caucus newsletter and the steering committee would like to just thank Stu for his dedicated work and effort in putting that newsletter together every month and I just uh, really appreciate so thank you Stu for doing that. Uh, we do have our state legislators Article 5 caucus website and if you go to the about tab it lists the uh, steering committee and how you can contact each one of us that are part of the steering committee of the caucus. And then myself, I'm on the steering committee, former state senator from Iowa, but I'm also executive director for Path to Reform. And really in the six years that I've, I've worked in this movement, I've really tried to bring harmony to all 50 states and assisting state legislators in understanding the power that they have in the constitution. And uh, you can check our pathtoreform.org website and really the, the ability for states to propose amendments to the constitution, uh, to course correct our nation as, this, as we the state see fit and really put we the people back in charge with, uh, uh, with in, in our country. So uh, with that, that's kind of the, the background with the two organizations that are hosting this. Uh, right now, what I'd like to do is introduce Ken Ivory. Ken uh, serves on the Article 5 uh, Caucus Steering Committee, has been active in preserving state roles in the operation of our representative republic. He's uh, served in the Utah House of Representatives, been active with ALEC, NCSL, and CSG. So uh, with that, I'm going to, uh, we're gonna turn it over to Ken, but we do have a question and answer uh, feature at the bottom. You can see all the participants. We have a tap, chat feature. And after the uh, keynote presentation, we will go back and uh, take some questions, answer some questions, try, try to provide a little bit of dialogue and, and back and forth in the group. So uh, with that, uh, let's turn it over to Ken. Neil, thank you very much. It uh, is an incredible time. And, and we're so honored that you would join us tonight on Constitution Day. You know, the aforetime Prime Minister of Great Britain, William Gladstone, said that our Constitution is the most wonderful work ever struck off by the brain and purpose of man. George Washington called it little short of a miracle. It speaks volumes that you would take time, you would invest your time in an event to restore the American voice. I serve as senior vice president of a company called Aon AI. We help local and state governments optimize their, their land and, and, and their wealth in their community. Uh, I serve as the, the chair to restore the center of the balance of government. I uh, teach American federalism at UVU. 
Uh, but most importantly, I'm a dad and I'm, a, I'm now a grandpa. And I originally ran for office and served nine years in the Utah House of Representatives uh, because as a dad like you, I'm tremendously concerned about the direction that our country is going. And I'm concerned about what that means for my children and your children and what we leave to them. Uh, Charles Dickens in his, his famous line in, in Tale of Two Cities said, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. We're gonna talk about some of the worst of times. We know that, we've seen that in 2020, but I also wanna talk about the best of times and that involves you. And that's why we're here tonight, to in restore the American voice and you're at the heart of that. Uh, we've seen in 2020 all sorts of challenges, all sorts of difficulties. We've, we've seen all sorts of, of images that have wrenched our souls. Um, in May of, of this year, there were rallies and protests all around the nation. Um, these, are, these are not easy things to talk about, uh, but to know where we're going, we have to know clearly where we are. We have to look clearly at where we are and understand that so that we can take a look at where we're going. I want to show you a video clip uh, that, again, it's, it's challenging to, to look at, but to address this, it shows us a clear path, and I think it shows us very much of, of where we're going. Can we, uh, can we get that video clip up? I think like you, I remember watching these all around the nation and, and asking ourselves, what is becoming of our country? Uh, when you look at a scene like that, everyone is frustrated. Uh, the young man on, on the car, clearly frustrated. The driver of the car, frustrated, frightened. Uh, the people watching it, frustrated, scared. Everyone looking at that scene, no one is happy, it seems in watching what's been unfolding in our nation this year. That young man who was on the car gave a news interview and I happened to watch it and it hit me like a ton of bricks. They asked him what he was doing and he said this, if you can tell me something better uh, for me, a way that we can change the world without trying to make all that noise, then I'll get off the streets. I won't stand in front of cars anymore if there's an easy path. Think about what he says, if, if there's an easy path, I won't make all that noise. I won't have to stand in cars. But feeling that there's not, the outlet is frustration. Frustration is going to find an outlet. And if it doesn't have a constitutional path, an easy path that he said, it's going to percolate over in frustration as we're seeing. And that's what we're here to talk about tonight, to talk about how do we get to that path that the founders gave. And I, I submit they did give us an easy path. They gave us the recipe. In fact, they gave us the recipe to happiness. In, in our national birth certificate, in the Declaration of Independence, it says that we are endowed with unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Think about that. In our initial governing document, the statement of purpose for why we became a nation was to pursue happiness. That's the very purpose of our government, was to pursue happiness. So where did we go wrong? What, how are we here? And, and, and what do we do now? How do we, how do we emerge from this? There, there's a great statement that I've always loved from Henry David Thoreau. He, uh, you're probably familiar with this. He made the statement that for the thousands hacking at the leaves of evil, there's one striking at the root. This is an election year. Every two years, we have politicians and others stand up and, and promise that, that all our wildest dreams will come true at the national level if, if we vote, and that our job is merely to vote, and that will solve all the problems. And yet, the frustration continues to grow and to mount, and the problems haven't been solved. In fact, they're getting worse. If that's the case, what is the root? What is the root problem, and how do we solve it? Well, that's what we want to talk about tonight. And that involves you. It involves you and your rights and your responsibility and your power to restore the American voice. I, uh, I learned a way to describe this a couple of years ago. It was January of 2017. It was a couple of days before the start of our legislative session in Utah. I was in Des Moines. I was speaking on issues similar to this. 
and uh, I was sick. I just wanted to get home. You know how it is. I wanted to get ready for the session. I wanted to have uh, my footing under me and I was late and I got to the airport and there was a freezing rain and everything was shut down. And so we sat on the plane in Des Moines. I had to connect through Minneapolis. Finally, the plane takes off late and it's pretty apparent I'm likely to miss my connecting flight in Minneapolis. And as we're going, I'm checking my watch and I'm looking, we get close to Minneapolis and I think I might, I might just be able to make the flight, but I didn't know the airport very well. And as we were about to land, I saw this giant of a man in a bright red University of Utah football t-shirt. Uh, in the middle of the aisle in the plane, I thought, he's going where I'm going. I'm just going to follow him. And as we got off the plane, I stood right behind him, and I, and I went right behind him. And as he carved a, a wave through the sea of people, we ran through the airport, and I was doing my best just to keep, keep up with him. And we got to the gate just as they were closing the door, and they sat us together in the exit aisle. And, and we did the, the customary, you know, what is your name, who are you? And, and uh, he told me that he was a football coach for the University of Utah. But he played for BYU, and if you know anything about football in Utah, that rivalry is called the Holy War. He asked me, who are you? And I told him, I'm Ken Ivory, I'm a state representative in Utah. And then he said, but what do you do? And I thought if I explained to him American federalism, I may as well try to speak to him in Japanese. And I said, well, let me see if I can put it this way. That Holy War, that's a pretty big game, right? Oh yeah, it's a big game. Practice is different, oh yeah. The, the, the preparation is different, the media is different, uh, the, the, the speech on game day on Saturday is different. As you run out of the tunnel, the stadium is different, it's packed and the energy is electric. And, and as you stand on the 50 yard line, facing off against your opponent, you buckle your chin strap and you just get ready to, to kick off and go. And as you look down, there's no lines on the field anywhere. And he turned to me and he said, oh, that would be a disaster. I said, that's what government's like today. There are no lines on the field. What I'm trying to do in state government is repaint the lines on the field. We don't know where to stand. We can't defend a line we can't define, and we don't know what out of bounds is anymore. We don't know what the line of scrimmage is anymore, or what a first down is, or what the goals are. We can't defend a line that we can't define, and it's up to you, as we'll see, to repaint to define and defend the lines that restore the American voice. There, uh, our constitution was defined very clearly, these lines. This was not something that was made up. Uh, one of the primary framers of the constitution, James Wilson, he was a uh, signer of the Declaration of Independence, one of the, the primary speakers in the Constitutional Convention. He was an original member of the, of the US Supreme Court. He said, this constitution deserves praise for the accuracy with which the line is drawn between the powers of the general government and those of the states. We, we drew this line with as much accuracy as was possible. The idea of a line was critical because to govern a people over an extended territory, it was critical that those powers be divided, that the roles and responsibilities be clear so that the American voice was preserved. That gets us to the very specific purpose for dividing these powers, the very purpose of government, we're told back in our national birth certificate in the Declaration of Independence. It says that we're endowed with unalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And then it says this critical statement, to secure these rights, governments exist among men. I think that's the greatest governing quiz we could ever have, a one sentence quiz. What is the purpose of government to secure these rights? And that involves you. That critically involves you in the division of power. I, uh, I figured out a good way to explain why our government is divided and what this function is about. Uh, I, I learned a great way to explain this. My wife and I were on an anniversary vacation in Colorado. And I happened to be standing next to a gentleman from New York, a mountain biker. And we got to talking and again, he asked me what I did. I told him I was in the state legislature and that same question, he says, but what do you do? And again, I thought if I say federalism, it may just go over his head. And I said, let me see if I can explain it this way. You've got your mountain bike there. There's writing on the tires. He says, oh, yeah. Do you know what the writing is? He said, well, that's the tire pressure. I asked him, do you know how much the tire pressure is? He says, oh, yeah, it's 55 pounds per square inch. I said, well, what if your front tire had 105 pounds per square inch and your back tire had less than five? 
He said, oh, that would be a disaster. I said, well, what if you just rode the bike harder? He said, no, that won't work. I said, what if you got Lance Armstrong all hopped up, hopped up on steroids to ride your bike? Maybe that would work. No, 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 that won't work either. I said, maybe, just maybe, you just need to yank the handlebars harder to the right, or maybe you need to yank it harder to the left. Now, mind you, this was October 2016, our last presidential election, at the height of uh, election season. He says, no, 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 that won't work. You have to repair the bike. You have to repair and maintain the bike. I said, that's what my job is in state government. My job is to repair and maintain this bike because it's not about the rider and it's not about the direction that the bike goes as much as it is about maintaining the system, repairing and maintaining the system. And you're the maintenance engineers. You are the systems engineers for our system in our, our system of government. Uh, the, this bicycle of state was very clear. It, it, uh, the original recipe is very clear. The founders uh, gave us the, the, the directions and the recipe, James Madison, in, uh, in Federals 51, describing our system. He said, they knew that a democracy, as they described it, commits suicide. They said, it's as it's, it's short in their lives as it is violent in their deaths. They knew that a republic was the form of government that we needed to look at, but not any form of republic, not a single republic. That wouldn't work over a large extent of territory. That wouldn't allow and enable uh, the American voice to flourish and the ability to pursue our own unique vision of happiness over a large territory. Madison described that our system is a compound republic. He said, in the compound of Republic of America, the power surrendered by the people is first divided between two distinct governments state government and the national government, what we call the federal government today. For a specific reason, they said, we divided the power so that a double security would arise to the rights of the people, to the voice of the people, a double security, because the different governments would control each other. In our system of government, they had checks on checks on checks. A single security was not enough. They wanted a double security for the rights of the people. And so this division of power was critical. It was absolutely critical. This is not a spectator sport. This system requires you to be constantly in the game. I, uh, I'll share with you a secret, if you promise not to tell anyone. I had, uh, I had a nickname as a child, and, and it still leaves emotional wounds. The scars are deep. Um, I'll tell you, if you promise not to share with anyone, the, uh, if you're ready for this, the nickname was Chunky. Is that just horrible? Chunky. That was the nickname they gave me as a child. I hate it. I still hate it. There, there was one, and I think only one benefit to being chunky. When, uh, when we had the tug of war on the playground, I was at the end of the rope. And if it ever happened that our team would lose, I was on the end of the rope, and I didn't get pulled in the mud. Our system of government is like a tug of war. It requires healthy tension, by, by design, healthy tension. The founders described it as one set of representatives pulling against 13 sets of representatives. And they said it wouldn't be hard for them, but they had to pull. And, and it started out this way, where 13 sets of representatives were pulling together to maintain that healthy tension to our system of government. And as a few years went by, one by one, the states began dropping the rope. Uh, I forgot why we were even pulling the rope, one would say perhaps. And another, I'm, I'm tired of pulling on the rope. And uh, they don't really need me to pull on the rope. The others can pull just fine. And, and another, maybe uh, I'm kind of afraid of that, uh, that big guy on the other side of the rope. And maybe he's paying me not to pull on that rope. And one by one by one, as the 13 states became 50, they've all dropped the rope. And now the rope sits all over on the federal side. And when we talk about restoring balance, we usually talk about restoring balance in terms of maybe we can elect people in Washington to push on the rope. We all know that can't, that doesn't work. It doesn't work in tug of war any more than it works in our government. We can't push on the rope. We in the states have to pull. We have to pull, we have to pull together we don't have to pull hard, but we have to pull always. That's the very nature of our system of government. 
it's um, James Madison gave us a one sentence blueprint for our system of government. He described this system and the nature of the system very simply in, 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 one, in one sentence, this system that was meant to preserve and amplify the, the American voice. He said that the powers of government should be divided and balanced among the several branches of government, that no one could transcend their legal limits without being effectually checked and restrained. Think about that. Our, our very nature of government required division of responsibility with balance. Alexander Hamilton said that this balance of government is of the utmost importance because the balance provides a double security to the rights of the people. Divisions and limits and balance with checks and restraints. Does that sound like our government today? In fact, I would challenge you to ask any of your colleagues, where's the line in, in, in our government between the state and the national government? What are the limits of the federal government's power? What is the balance? What is that tire pressure today? And what are the powers of the states to defend and maintain that line that was critical to amplifying the governing voice, that pursuit of happiness that was the very purpose of our government? Is it any wonder if we can't, if we can't define this system of government, is it any wonder that the frustration is percolating, that the American voice is diminishing, and this frustration is increasing. If we can't even define and describe the system to be able to defend that, because you are the voice. You're the, the, the voice for the, for the people. Again, James Madison, in speaking about your role so critically, um, the Constitution was only ratified because the founders agreed that there needed to be a Bill of Rights. And in the first Congress, when James Madison was introducing the Bill of Rights, he introduced it with this statement. He said, the state legislatures will jealously and closely watch the operations of the national government, and they'll be able to resist with more effect every assumption of power, better than any power on earth can do, because they, you, are the sure guardians of the people's liberty. The sure guardians of the people's liberty, not the Supreme Court, not the president, not the Congress, not even the governors, you are the sure guardians of the people's liberty. What if as leaders, we don't know these duties? What if we don't know the rights? What if we don't know the powers and the critical responsibility as maintenance engineers in this system? Justice Kennedy answered that question. He, he talked about these structural protections in the constitution. That's what he called this. He called this this federalism, this system, these divisions and limits and balance. He said, these are the structural protections of the constitution and they're the most important ones. He said, the fragmentation of power produced by the structure of our government is central to liberty. And when we destroy it, we place liberty at peril. It's critical that we maintain the machine. I mean, you can imagine in a car, you, you leave a car sitting out in the driveway for years and years and years with no attention to the regular maintenance. And then you wanna just jump in and pick a driver to step on the gas and go the right, right around the track or left around the track. We know that intuitively. If we don't maintain the system, it really doesn't matter who drives or which direction they go as much as maintaining the vehicle. That's what we're called on to do. So the question at this point then is, uh, so what does it mean if we don't? And, and how do we begin to repair, to restore the lines, to maintain the lines? There's a great philosopher, Archimedes, spoke about how you solve some of the greatest problems uh, that exist. And he made this statement that I've always liked. He said, uh, give me a lever long enough and a fulcrum on which to place it and I'll move the world. Give me a lever long enough and a fulcrum on which to place it and I'll move the world. You're the fulcrum, I would submit. The lever, we know how that works, both inside our state and among our states, the leverage is magnifying our voice. You have the ability to magnify your voice through legislation and resolutions where your one voice working with your colleagues becomes the voice of the millions of people in your state. And then together, your state working with other states through the legislative organizations that we have, uh, was mentioned earlier by Neil, NCSL, CSG, ALEC. 
we have the ability then to leverage our voice beyond our states to restore that voice because the people are desperate. They're crying out for this. Utah took action on this, on this very thing. In this last session, my former colleagues in Utah passed a resolution, uh, HCR 16. It was a resolution calling for the creation of a national federalism task force. And the great thing about this resolution is it was co-sponsored and, and voted on and supported by members of both parties. You see, federalism is not about left and right, Republican and Democrat. It's not about what to decide. It's about where to decide. Once we decide where to decide, then let's have a great debate about what the policy should be. But so the resolution HCR 16 calls upon NCSL, CSG, and ALEC, National Council of State Legislatures, the Council of State Governments, and uh, American Legislative Exchange Council to leverage our voice. We leverage our voice within our state that we need to step up. We need to step up and prescribe to get back to the manufacturer's specifications. And then to have a great discussion among the state legislatures, the sure guardians, as to what are those lines on the field? Where are we supposed to stand? What is the line of scrimmage? What is out of bounds? What are the goals? What is that first down marker? Because we can't defend a line that we can't define. And it's up to us to pull, to create that healthy tension always. It's, um, you have the authority, you have the power, the people are calling upon you to do this. It kind of begs the question, why is this not talked about more? Why are we, what are we missing in this approach to the system of government, that recipe that they gave in the divisions and the limits and the balance that the state legislatures are to be able to maintain better than any power on earth can do? Uh, it reminds me of an experience I had. My grandmother used to send me out to get the eggs when I was a child and I would go out and go to get the eggs and they were terrifying. They would pack and I'd come back with my arms all bloody and packed up and it was absolutely frightening. Uh, years later, my wife and I decided that we should get chickens to be prepared and we went to the store and got chickens and raised them from little poults and as they got big enough to, to, to lay eggs, uh, my wife sent me out to get the eggs and remembering my experience from my childhood with my grandma, I put on a long sleeve shirt and gloves and hat and bundled up and as if I was putting on the battle armor and I went out to get the eggs. And as I opened the hatch and I looked in to grab the eggs, the chickens just kind of looked at me. And they didn't move, they didn't stir, they didn't, they didn't even rustle at all. I just grabbed the eggs and went into the house. I actually went back to the store, completely true story. I went back to the store where we bought the chickens. And I said, there's something wrong with my chickens. And she said, uh, well, what's the matter? I said, well, they don't peck. She says, oh yeah, we bred that out of them. We bred that out of them. Our job is to peck. Our constitutional system demands that we peck, that we provide that constitutional outlet for our people, that in their frustrations, they have a system of government closest to the people. Their voice is the loudest, the closest. Their rights are protected the nearest. And they're calling on you. Across the nation, surveys tell us over and over and over again that the American people are so frustrated with government. They're looking to you. You have that power. You have the authority. It's up to us to make sure that it's not bred out of us, that we help our colleagues understand this, that we help our constituents, your constituents understand this, that we work with colleagues around the nation because only you can do this. It, uh, if you believe as we do, as Justice Kennedy warned, that the fragmentation of power, these structural protections are central to liberty. They're central to the American voice. And if you believe that we're at a point in our nation that these protections are in peril, and if you believe that the system is the solution, we invite you to stand with us. We invite you to stand with us in defining the lines so that we can defend the lines.
so that we can begin to exercise again that healthy tension that provides the double security to the rights of the people. You have the power, you have the authority. The American people, their heart cry is out to you to protect these lines, these divisions of responsibility that protect and amplify their voice. I'll leave you before we go to questions with this one thought. We mentioned the, the tale of two cities at the beginning, the Charles Dickens, the best of times, the worst of times. We've talked about the worst of times, some of the worst of times, and it's, it, I believe it's serious. I believe you believe it's serious or you wouldn't be investing your time in this program that we can leave something better. We can maintain and repair that system better for our children. And so I'll leave you with this statement that Ronald Reagan made. He said, this is a wonderful time to be alive. We're lucky not to live in pale and timid times. We've been blessed with the opportunity to stand for something, for liberty and freedom and fairness. And I would submit for the American voice and restoring and maintaining the American voice. And he said, these are things worth fighting for, worth devoting our lives to. So let us go forth with good cheer and stout hearts, happy warriors out to seize back a country and a world of freedom. Thank you. Well, Ken, that was that was really great. I, every time I uh, listen to you or have an opportunity to hear a presentation, it just uh, it amazes me how you always bring it back to those founding principles of government. And and I reflect back a little bit as a, a new state senator and you know coming in and and understanding what needs to be done. There's so many logistic things, but uh, focusing back to the fundamentals of the constitutional structure we have, the role that the states have, the role that state legislators have in, in, the, in the US Constitution to propose amendments, to course correct if it is necessary, and to really be the voice of the American people. We elect uh, representatives to represent us, uh, and it is much easier on a state level to have our voice being heard and carry that message on uh, than it is in the national government. So what the uh, state legislators Article 5 caucus is doing, uh, the communicating that we're doing, what you're doing here, Ken, is just really great. Um, share a little bit about your experience as a new, uh, a new uh, uh, House member in Utah and uh, some of the things, how, how quick it takes us to, uh, uh, to ramp up and things that we need to, to learn. What are some of the things that you uh, felt that uh, was lacking when you first arrived at the Utah State Capitol? You know, that's a great question, Neil. I've asked this question all around the nation. Um, when I was elected, we had a training and it was the new state legislator training. And we, uh, we got our parking pass and we got our key and our, our pass to the building and they showed us where the bathrooms were and the insurance forms. And then we sat in a committee room and they showed us how the microphones work and, and how to be recognized in a committee hearing. And then they said, uh, just remember the lobbyists aren't your friends when you're no longer in office. Congratulations, you're now a state legislator. And, and Neil, that was, that was state legislator training. And I've, I've asked state legislators all around the nation and their experience is roughly similar. And so when we don't have any exposure to this basic structure, what uh, Justice Kennedy called the structural fundamentals, the most important ones, and we don't know that we're the sure guardians of the liberty, and we don't know the powers that we have to do this, and we don't know where those lines are, is it any wonder that we're running around on that field with no lines painted on it? So I, I would submit to you, Neil, I had, a, I had an experience a couple of years ago uh, flying to speak in Washington about similar subjects. And, and the flight attendant said, oh, please, please tell them we've got to restore this government. And, uh, and then we got to talking about this. I shared that same story with them. And they said, well, we have continuing education. As flight attendants, we have to have continuing education credits all the time. Doctors, lawyers, engineers, all sorts of people have to have edu continuing education credits. But state legislators who are 
the sure guardians of the people's liberty who hold life, liberty, and property literally in their hands. There, there, there's no continuing education requirement at all. Neil, I would submit that one of the great things we could do is to rally state leaders to take it upon ourselves to say we really should have some continuing education requirement on the very structure of the system. Yeah, it, exactly. And uh, it, it, it is something, you know, something that I learned early on when I arrived in the Iowa Senate and a, a senior senator uh, mentioned to me, uh, Neil, all you have to do is remember is that laws control the citizens, the constitution controls the government. And we as, as we the people, we as Americans, we have to work with our elected representatives to make sure that that constitutional structure is in order, that it's as written, and that we can truly uh, be uh, a consent of the governed as we do things. And in the last hundred years, we've stepped away from that. Um, Ken, I, I, I do have a Mark White has a, answered a question. He's from Hawaii. He was with you at the um, Convention of States uh, simulation that they had back in Williamsburg, Virginia in 2016. And he asks, what advice can you give people working towards an Article 5 convention in such a blue state like Hawaii? Do you know of any framing or arguments that can persuade Democrats? Yeah, Mark, uh, aloha. That was, a, that was a great experience to uh, begin to be in that incredible place. And, and that simulated convention was a marvelous experience. Uh, yes, in fact, the work that's being done in Utah in the Federalism Commission and that, that resolution, that H HCR 16 calling for the National Federalism Task Force had bipartisan support. We, we began to frame things in the Federalism Commission that the critical question is not what to decide, it's where to decide. The critical question is where should things be deciding? Where should we be deciding education policy? That's the first question. Where should we be deciding health and human service policies? Where should we be deciding transportation policy? And then we have a great debate over what the policy should be. But right now we don't even ask question one anymore. The, the federal government continues to assume more and more and more power. So to your point, we've found that even among colleagues on both sides of the aisle, when we talk about where should these decisions be made, uh, we, we wanna gravitate to, to the issue and what should be decided. But we say, that's great. The first question is jurisdiction. Who should be deciding that? And once, we've, once we have clarity on who should be deciding, and, and there's some wonderful examples. I mean, education, um, you know, health and human services, things like that, transportation, uh, job services. Um, you know, to think that, Neil, we have a, a city on the outskirts of Salt Lake. Uh, it's spelled T-O-O-E-L-E. -E. It's pronounced Tooele. Well, in Utah, we have six members of Congress. We have four members in the House and two senators. So that means 529 members of Congress are not from Utah. That also means, Neil, that 529 members of Congress cannot pronounce Tooele to save their life. And yet they're deciding education policy, health and human service policy, job policy for the people of Tooele. They have no idea what the community is like, what the needs are. So, so I, I, Mark, I think to that point, we've been successful. And in fact, the Federalism Commission in Utah, there's the, uh, the agenda and the plan is, is online. And we created a 2018-2019 plan that was unanimously adopted. That said, we have to know where the lines are. We have to know what our rights are. We wanna get states together to begin discussing this. And everybody signed off on that. That's a good point, Ken and, and Mark too, that, uh, you know, having each state reaffirm uh, the founding principles of federalism, the separation of powers. As I've worked uh, through the last year, uh, meeting with both blue and red states and communicating with folks, the, the biggest challenge that we have in, in any kind of path to reform, in our effort of path to reform, is having people understand the process and separating out, or separating out the policy on the side and having 
both blue and red states come together and agree on here is the process that we can have effective reform, then meeting in convention, in a conference, in ability to talk about what are the issues that is important and common to all 50 states and address those issues. Uh, as I was meeting with uh, legislative leaders from, from uh, New Mexico uh, just recently, uh, you know, we, the concern of money and politics, campaign finance reform, the unchecked spending, you know, balanced budget, those kinds of things. If we can bring states together and discuss those critical national issues, we can come to that consensus in, in dealing with both a majority opinion and a minority opinion. That's what's going to bring uh, this process together. And that's really the path to reform is setting aside the issues and agreeing on the process and then re reinvigorating that state process that is there in the constitution that can be activated and must be activated. Yeah, I think that's right, Neil. And, and the question that we ask is, what if we don't? What, what if we don't do that? What if we never have a discussion about, is there any division of responsibility and we continue to centralize more and more and more? Um, those decisions get farther and farther away from us. And, and this is what we're seeing. We're seeing that frustration percolate up that they don't have a voice. And so their frustration manifests in unhealthy ways. We really have to give them these healthy constitutional outlets. And, you know, as you said, it's, it's, it's process, process matters. And, and what we're seeing is every four years, we throw all the chips on red or black and we go to the roulette wheel. And, and if the president is elected to, to one side's party, then they think everything is great for four years and, and the other side completely loses out for four years. And, and then the reverse happens four years later. Our system was never meant to be that way. Yes. The, 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 the vast things that affect our life, liberty and property were handled locally where you can, you can go to your neighbor you go right down to the state house. You can mobilize there. You can go talk to your neighbor. Your voice is, is it matters and it, it's amplified. But think about what happens when we don't. People check out. They either get frustrated and manifest that way or they just check out. And Neil, either one of those, mm -hmm. uh, I would say, are really drastic for our children. And to see what's happening in the centralization of government, I think the greatest bipartisanship we see in Washington is the growth of, of centralized government. It, it, exactly. And, you know, we just, we just sit there and we just wait for things to happen. And, you know, the biggest challenge is, you know, there's, you know, presidential election, you know, taking all the air out of the room and consuming everything. And, and 2020 has been a, a very uh, interesting year to deal with uh, all of the things that have come on and, and, and really show some of the weakness of how we've allowed this system to devolve. And it is now so important for states to stand up and reclaim that authority, that place at the table with the national government, that it is, we just don't wait until something comes down from Washington, D.C., but we actually get involved. We get determine what those issues are and that, then act on it. It's a lot of work bringing 50 states together or, or 40 or 38 or 34, whatever the, the, the process that we're working on works, but it needs to be done. Individual citizens, state legislatures, and states need to rally around reestablishing those lines of our constitutional form of government, or we're going to lose it. And we just can't wait until the next person is elected. This has got to be an ongoing process. There's an election every two years. So we, we, we always tend to kick the can down the road because no one wants to deal with issues in an election year. But with this process of states re-engaging the national government, the national government they created, they should have that final authority on how that national government should operate. And that's what's so important about our state legislators, Article 5 caucus, the newsletter. And we really want to grow uh, the people that are participating. Right now, uh, as I said earlier, we have about 8,000 emails that go out monthly with the newsletter. About 7,000 are state legislators, another uh, 1,000 are interested people. And, and what we want to do is really grow that network. We're finding that about 1,000 people are opening up, 1,000 to 1,300 people are opening up 
uh, the newsletter every month. We want to grow that and we encourage state legislators to go to the Article 5 uh, State Legislators Article 5 Caucus homepage. There's a place where you can click not only to get the newsletter, but to actually become part of the caucus. We can start collaborating, communicating, and working together. And that first step may be reaffirming each state's support of federalism in our national government and re reclaiming that uh, lost path of reform. So that's uh, something I really encourage everyone uh, that's on this um, webinar to, uh, to really contemplate and think about. Um, any other questions that we might have out there that uh, need to be addressed? Or Ken, do you have uh, anything else that you might want to uh, address? Yeah, you know, Neil, to be, to be clear, um, Article 5 is clearly one of the powers of the states. And I like to call it the multi-tool. It's, it's probably the most potent power that the states have. But in the resolution that Utah passed, this is about just convening the states to discuss what are the lines and limits? Are there any lines? Are there any divisions? And they say, be it resolved, the legislature of the state of Utah, governor concurring, calls upon NCSL, CSG, ALEC, to coordinate in the creation of a national federalism task force for the purpose of convening a series of summits to consider and develop plans for restoring and maintaining clearly discernible divisions in the roles and responsibilities of the national government and the states for the benefit and the engagement of the American people. You know, the, um, the last Democrat governor in Utah, Scott Matheson, he wrote a book called Out of Balance. And in the book, he quotes Madison in Federal Sport Teen, and he says, we have to work on this devolution of power, this division of roles and responsibilities, because if we don't do it on our terms, and we don't do it in an orderly fashion, it's going to devolve at some point. You can't centralize forever. And he was making the point that to preserve the union, to preserve the diversity, and to preserve that unique pursuit of happiness, we have to restore this division of power and responsibility. Uh, very good, very good, Ken. And, you know, we've had a couple of questions here on some of the policy issues and things like that. And, and yes, there, as we move forward with these webinars, because this is a first in a series of webinars that we're going to be hosting, and I want everybody to save the date right now for Tuesday, November 17th, 8 p.m. Eastern, for our second uh, webinar. And we may get into and start talking about an issue. We did have a, a question from uh, from a gentleman uh, that's concerned about how can uh, a convention of states or states meeting in convention affect some of the existing rights that we already have. And there's a, been a lot of work that has been done on that. And it falls into the Bill of Rights and the inalienable rights. And there are rights that we have as an Americans, as US citizens, that were rights prior to our constitution. And they're just reaffirmed in our constitution. So as we get down the road of discussing maybe some particular issues, uh, we can talk about that. There's been some great work done on all the applications that have been submitted to Congress by the states. And there's been some analysis on, on a lot of different areas. But this evening, we won't, don't want to get into the specific issues that may come forward, because those are the issues that the states are going to talk about. So I just wanted to uh, clarify that uh, on a couple of questions that we had on particular issues. Yeah, Neil. So you think about just the, the, the basic fundamental question. Is there any line? Is there any division of responsibility? Um, I have a little book called Where's the Line? Um, How the States Protect the Constitution. And, and, and I write a little couplet in that, that I say, if there's no line, there's no limit. And if there's no limit, then ultimately there's no liberty. And so to begin even a, uh, understanding, is there any division of responsibility between the national government and the states? And then how do we clearly understand what those divisions are? And restoring that knowledge base, that's a starting point. Because again, we can't defend lines we can't define. Yeah, excellent, excellent, excellent. Um, 
Yeah, I just, uh, as we're kind of coming up to the end here, let's see, I've got another question here. Um, you I just have a point here you mentioned, let me just get this question up here and I can get it to you. Can you mention the constitution would not have been ratified if not for article five power, two thirds of the states to call a convention for proposing amendments such as a bill of rights. Today, there are 28 balanced budget amendment applications, six open applications, including New York from 1790, two thirds of the states, 34, have unrescinded under article five applications. Congress does not have a law to call or count applications. Should the states call the balanced budget amendment convention next year. Should they file a mandatus suit to force Congress to count and call a balanced budget amendment convention? Ken, what, what is your kind of view of the applications that have been submitted and uh, con Congress's uh, either inability or in interest in not dealing with the states on this? What are you sensing? Yeah, that, um, you know, Neil, that's a, that's a fundamental consequence of losing these divisions and losing this, this st structural fundamentals. Um, when, when only few and defined things are in Washington, then there's few and defined things for which they have to pay for and, and then be lobbied for. But as that power continues to assume and grow, then there's more to lobby for, there's more to spend for. And, and Neil, right now we're, we're right on the border of $27 trillion in the national debt. Uh, when I started in office, it was 10 trillion. We're now at 27 trillion. And so, you know, when we ask the question, where's the line, how much can we spend? Can we, can we pretend to print prosperity indefinitely? And, and it seems quite apparent that in Washington, there's no effort to restrain that in any way. So, um, yeah, I support and applaud all efforts of the states to, to bring um, fiscal integrity back to our nation. Because when we think about what we're pushing off to our children and grandchildren, uh, it, it just breaks my heart. I mean, it literally breaks my heart that we're consuming today what we're going to require them to pay tomorrow. And, and I think that's just completely immoral. Can't, can't agree with you more. And, and uh, I, Ken and I were fortunate to be part of a, uh, being commissioners to a planning convention that uh, the state of Arizona called back in September of uh, 2017. And there were 19 states there there were 70 plus state legislators there, a few uh, formers like myself. And I, even though we planned for putting, uh, you know, putting together an Article V convention, working with Congress to deal with the issues at the point when 34 applications would reach Congress and things like that. But what I recognized there, and when I walked away from that uh, convention, I have to do everything in my power to get states meeting. And that's what I've been doing since September of 2017, working with a lot of different groups, working with a lot of individuals, with legislators, with legislative leaders to get that process together that they are comfortable meeting together, talking about the issues. And if we can, if that kind of power representation can rise to the surface here in the United States, it will diffuse that central power in Washington. And that's really what the state legislators Article 5 caucus is about. That's what our path to reform process is about, to show individuals that this is a safe and orderly and legal process and states not only have the right to do it, they have the responsibility to do it. And each one of our state uh, legislators, our elected representatives, should be at the forefront of bringing something like that together so that we can deal with some of the pressing national issues as uh, at, the, at the table and not just waiting for some responses to come back uh, from Washington. And we find that it's a one size fits all. And every state is uniquely different as I traveled from state capital to state capital meeting with state legislators both uh, Republican and Democrat, uh, I find that there's a uniqueness, there's an interest in really 
uh, establishing a process that states have an equal voice in assessing national issues. So I, I just really appreciate that. No, Neil, and, and there's a structural reason for that, right? When, uh, when you're accountable to your neighbors, you act differently. You know, I mentioned Tooele, Utah, and 529 members of Congress can probably not pronounce it. Well, they have no accountability to the people in Tooele. So, so the policies that they're making, the people in Tooele don't vote for 529 members of Congress. And so the, the acts that they take are, are largely without accountability. But at the state level, these are our neighbors. These are our friends. These are our family members. Your, your state representative and senator lives around the corner from you. And the consequences of those decisions fall on them along with their neighbors. And so that's the way the government was intended to be so that the vast majority of decisions that affect our life and livelihood are made by people that do have that accountability. And we've gotten so far away from that. That's where I believe this frustration is, is, is just reaching a boiling point that if we don't act, it's going to continue to manifest in unhealthy ways. Uh, perfect. I do have uh, I do have a gentleman that has uh, raised his hand, uh, John Cogswell. Uh, Marcus, just for a, a, just for a, a few moments, uh, can you maybe uh, unmute uh, John and see what kind of comment or question he might have? Hi, John, we do welcome you to the conversation. You know, maybe he didn't have a, doesn't have a microphone or something like that to go in, maybe put it into a question here. We do wanna wrap up here pretty quick because we're coming up to our, our hour limit, but if there's a, a last comment uh, that anyone like to, to share through question and answer, we can do it or uh, John, if you can speak for a moment, we'll let you have the floor. Can you hear me now? Yes, John. Okay, thank you. Um, I wanted to address the issue of the gentleman that talked before about the po what you referred to as the policy issues about our rights and so forth. And I think in your comments regarding the Arizona Convention of States uh, raises a very interesting issue, and that is that there may be fear that bringing the states together would do some ruination to our fundamental rights. And I think what happened in Arizona and the respect that was shown for the issues that you have been talking about tonight uh, was overwhelmingly respectful of the Constitution that you might just address that briefly because I think people are concerned that maybe the states will run away and do a screw up job on our Constitution. Yeah, that, that is an excellent question. And uh, uh, that's always been one of the, uh, uh, oh, what I call fear, uncertainty and doubt that is always thrown out. And there are so many uh, backstops and abilities to um, protect ourselves from that. And what I saw, and I'll have Ken kind of or, uh, kind of add in, but what I saw is of those 70 plus state legislators that were in Arizona deliberating, it wasn't like a raucous political convention. It was like a legislative session working through the issues, working with one another, states working together, one state, one vote. I found that the majority of those people there, all of those people there were more interested in the future of the government than they were interested in their own political careers. And Ken, I don't know if you sensed the same thing uh, with the colleagues that were there at Arizona, but I would put all of my faith and I would risk our constitutional republic in the hands of the states and our elected state legislators. Yeah, I had the same experience, Neil. Um, in the Williamsburg Simulated Convention, it, we had Republicans and Democrats, and everyone came away with the sense that we can do this. And, and there was a reverence, you know? There was a, this was a simulated convention, and yet there was a great reverence for 
I think there's something screwed up. Showing and proposing what we might be able to do oh, in, in no, meeting no. and discussing what yeah. the potential is for, for <laughs> restoring balance to our nation. And, um, you know, if, if we don't have those conversations, you know, these are hard conversations to have. If we don't have the conversations, we already know the trajectory. They're we know where things are going now. And, and, and I, just, I just leave you one of my favorite quotes on that point. So to be clear, there are a number of avenues. The states have a number of powers. James Madison talked about them in Federalist 28. Hamilton talked about them in Federalist 46. There are a number of powers. I think as we go along in these seminars, we'll start to break some of those powers and things down, the specific things. Article 5 is a major power and tool that they have. Um, Three-fourths of, of the states to ratify is a huge bar and a hurdle. In fact, uh, 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 Scalia made the statement that if he could get one amendment, he would get an amendment to make it easier to get amendments because the three-fourth bar is so high that we haven't seen any amendments from the state so far. But George Washington made a great statement in his farewell address. I mean, this was this used to be required reading when we were having those those continuing educa education classes to know government. You'd, you'd look at the Declaration of Independence, the Articles of the Confederation, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and George Washington's farewell address. And he said, if in the opinion of the people, the distribution or modification of the constitutional powers is ever in any particular wrong. Let it be changed by an amendment in the way the constitution designates, but let there be no change by usurpation. Don't just let them take the power. Don't just give the power away because that may be good in one instance. It's the customary weapon by which free government is destroyed. If we don't maintain clear lines of responsibility, George Washington said, that's the way free government is destroyed. We have to have these conversations about the roles and responsibilities. Imagine a company, Neil, yep. imagine a company that didn't have clear roles and responsibilities and everybody wanted to be the CEO or everybody wanted to be the mail clerk. Either way, it doesn't work. And a nation the size of ours, as complex as ours, our founders gave us the recipe of very intricate level of divisions of responsibility with limits and balance and checks and it's time to look at the original recipe, Neil. It's time to pull yeah, out the- Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and Ken, with, uh, with that, uh, we're at our time. And I know there's a lot of questions or a lot of interest. We could go on and on. But this is why we're going to continue on with these webinars. And, and look to the newsletter, to announcements for uh, what's going to be coming up, the topics. Suggest the topics. Our contact information is on the homepage of the State Legislators Article 5 Caucus that you can contact each of us. Uh, look at some of the reading uh, on our Path to Reform website. Uh, we've got a great essay talking about breaking ranks and why we believe bringing states together to deal with national issues is the path to really course correcting our country. So with that, I want to say thank you for all that participated tonight. And Ken, you did a, a marvelous job. Uh, we did have a comment from somebody that says that needs to be distributed on Constitution Day to every classroom in the country. So maybe this is something the caucus can do together. So with that, thank you, Ken, for the presentation. Thank you all for participating and all of those that had a hand in making this first in a series of webinars a success. Thank you.